Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you were able to join us this evening for this webinar. I'm Ralph Hampson and I'm from the Department of Social Work. And this webinar is hosted by the University of Melbourne Social Work Alumni Association. And you can see on that slide the members of that committee who so generously invited us to do a presentation on the impact of COVID. As you know, this is part of a series that the Alumni Association has put together under the leadership of Janet Farrow. And a few months ago, we had um, the webinar on homelessness. And so this is the second one that the alumni have invited us to present in. So we thank them for that. Before I go any further, I would like to start by first acknowledging the first and continuing custodians of Melbourne, the Wurundjeri people of the greater Kulin Nation. I offer respects to their elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. This evening, Professor Lynette Joubert will lead the presentation, which will focus on social work's response to COVID-19 in acute hospital services. The presentation will go for about 40 minutes and then there will be time for questions. So without further ado, let me introduce Professor Lynette Joubert, who's going to guide us through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. And a warm welcome to all of you who are here this evening. We are delighted to be able to tell you about the project that we have been involved in over the past seven weeks. And I would like very much now to acknowledge all our colleagues from the five health social work departments across Melbourne who participated in this project. I'd like to say that this is a practitioner initiated project focusing on practice-based research and based in one of the academic practi practitioner partnerships which we have in the Department of Social Work across hospitals in Victoria. This project started with a discussion in March of this year. Alison Hocking, Lisa Brady and myself were having a discussion about practice research in general. And very soon the conversation was taken over by preparation for COVID-19. And both of them became totally immersed in their discussion about all the changes that were happening in social work departments as they prepared for something that they didn't know exactly what it would look like. Alison made the comment, this is something we need to record. And this is something that's going to last way beyond this pandemic. And Lisa Brady raised the chance of actually using a digital platform, Basecamp, which St. Vincent's was using in the domestic violence project that they were hosting. And so we bought the base camp and used it for this project. This is a qualitative study and 106 health social workers who registered with base camp expressed different aspects of their experience, which we have now analyzed and would like to discuss with you this evening. Separately, we have been meeting on a fortnightly basis with the managers of these five hospitals. And what we did not know in March, and what we didn't know when we started Base Camp, that in actual fact, this would be a record of the lockdown period that happened very soon in the following months in Victoria. Each hospital elected to choose senior social workers who would act as champions for the project. And these people drove interest in each hospital site and did a wonderful job of presenting on base camp and starting the whole process going. And I'd really like to acknowledge their participation and interest and the contribution that they've made to what is really becoming a long lasting impact of what COVID meant two health social workers working on the front line. Now, Base Camp had a very varied program, as you can see from this slide. And basically, it stretched from 
professional development opportunities, um, different guidelines that were sent to us internationally, nationally, and locally. People gave advice on what they now know and which they didn't know before COVID-19 started. There was a lot of advice given about PPE and how this impacted on a person's professional and personal behavior. Resources were shared. And very interestingly, we held at least two interviews a week over a six week period with social workers across the different sites. And these really demonstrated what the experience was. And people I think really enjoyed hearing about what colleagues elsewhere across Melbourne were experiencing. We undertook a thematic analysis of all the comments on Basecamp using an Atride and Sterling model. And moving from the basic themes, which actually over the six weeks remained pretty constant, we were able to identify six organizing themes. Health service innovation and social work practice did really impact on the experience. And here, of course, was the electronic record that was introduced across three hospitals during this time. Then social workers found themselves offering unique support to community organizations outside of the hospital, such as how to wear PPE, how to communicate with um, masks, etc., which they would not under normal circumstances have been engaged in. Personal safety and carrying that home between home and work was a major factor that was discussed. Communication while wearing a mask was also a factor that needed a lot of practice, guidelines and sharing both humorous and otherwise between social workers. Working from home became a reality. It was something that had been discussed before in social work departments, but this was now a reality and all sorts of other issues impacted on that, not the least homeschooling. Social distancing has both its positives and negatives. And perhaps the most important positive that has emerged from this is that distance has been found not to matter when you are able to use online forms of communication like we are doing this evening. And especially for social workers, being able to connect with regional and rural clients was an important factor. Without any hesitation, I can say that there can only be one global theme for all the comments that emerged out of Basecamp, and that is resilience and practice in an era of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are engaged now in developing all sorts of thematic analysis out of this, and as part of our practice research initiative, we'll be publishing these in time to come. So I'm not going to waste any precious time going into detail, except to say that it was really interesting how the themes were sustained across the six weeks. Last week, we held a focus group with the intent of looking what had happened from the front line and what managers felt would be long lasting. And I'd just like to briefly mention those. First of all, working from home is now a reality. And I think everyone is of the opinion that this is going to be sustained way beyond the pandemic. Social workers now have such confidence in telehealth skills and patients seem to really enjoy this way of communicating with them. The regional and rural barriers, which were always of concern to health social workers, are now reduced, again, because of online capacity and online communication. There is, of course, a large unknown, and that is what will be the impact of COVID-19 into the future on personal health of people who've actually experienced it, on unemployment, housing, family life. These are all unknowns that will be waiting for our social workers in the future. I would like to now acknowledge that this project offered fieldwork placements for several of our students who were hoping to complete their degree in a timely fashion.
And I would like to thank here Noor Latif, Danielle Calder, Lynn Tran, Leith Kenny, and James Simmons, who have taken the initiative to develop a model for field work placements out of their experiences on three COVID-19 related practice research projects. And you'll see from this that they've divided this into the values and ethics and graduate attributes that every one of our students is aiming for, to the tasks that they were given to complete by the department on their placement. And then very interestingly, to the unique opportunities that this kind of placement offered them. And I think that this model is going to be something that lasts way beyond the current pandemic. We're very fortunate tonight to have two of our students with us. And I'd just like to ask Danielle, first of all, and then Leith, to say a few words about the experience that they had working on this project. Danielle, would you like to start first? Thank you, Lynette. Um, well, yes, um, as, as Lynette's just outlined, this placement provided a wonderful opportunity across all of the prescribed learning outcomes for students. But more than that, for me, it was an incredibly enriching experience and has led me to develop, um, dare I say, a passion for practice-based research, which I wouldn't have anticipated a few months ago. Initially, when I found out I'd be working on this project, I thought it sounded very interesting, but honestly, mostly I was just relieved I could complete a placement at all in 2020. I was a bit disappointed that I'd be working from home and wasn't going to be physically placed in an agency or hospital and miss the experience of, of all the things that go with that. And then, of course, the context of lockdown and the fact that my children and husband were all working and schooling from home as well threw up some challenges. But all of you would have your own version of that story. In fact, everyone does almost in the entire world. And it's the collective nature of the experience of the pandemic, albeit in varying degrees, that I reflect on a lot during placement and was something that really struck me um, about the contributions that the social workers were making to base camp. They were assisting patients to navigate the landscape of the pandemic whilst also navigating it themselves in their personal lives. And that was something that lots of social workers reported finding difficult and, and exhausting. This came through repeatedly in those short video interviews Lynette just mentioned, where the goal was to connect social workers from, um, you know, from all the five hospitals. And I loved these interviews. They actually ended up providing some of the richest experiences for me of the placement and a palpable sense of the pragmatism, dedication and humility came through from the workers, which was in contrast with the narrative that was playing out in the media at the time around the heroism of frontline workers. I was finding a much stronger sense of the human rather than the superhuman, which was very interesting and, and inspiring actually, and has been a very significant and enduring impression of, of health social workers that I've taken from the project and continue to reflect on, even though my placement's now finished. Thanks so much, Danielle. Leith, would you like to say a few words? Yes, yeah, so um, I began my placement carrying on from Danielle um, and starting halfway through, I was able to sort of look at Basecamp as a platform and think about how are social workers using this platform and what sort of content was being shared. There was advice, there was resources, um, there was many anecdotal experiences about COVID um, which were gaining a lot of attention. Um, and starting at this point also meant that I was able to provide a new set of eyes over the data and start looking at what were the basic themes that were coming out. Um, as Danielle mentioned, um, a big highlight was seeing how connection was really formed on this platform. Um, I loved that a trivia committee was formed between the hospitals. Um, and today we had our first um, trivia competition with great success. So it's also the fun outcomes of this um, form of connection. One thing I found really great from this placement was it really built on um, student research capabilities, you know, from learning how to use research software like Envivo confidently um, to analyze data from focus groups, interviews, and the base camp content, um, from doing simple tasks like transcribing data from the manager meetings to then applying a rationale to transform that data into themes. So it was also a wonderful opportunity to work collaborati collaboratively with research experts and um, really see how practice research operates and the importance of partnerships between universities and organisations. Thanks very much, Liz. 
And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the social work managers who are going to be speaking this evening. And we are going to start with Alison Hocking, who's the social work manager at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Alison. Hi, everybody. Um, apologies if you hear screaming in the background. It's toddler taming time downstairs. So that's what that uh, blood curling scream might be. Um, I just wanted to very quickly set the scene and the picture from a management point of view of um, where we, where we started and where we got to really, and my colleagues are gonna come after me and give you a lot more depth and richness of, of varying experience of this. Um, it started for me, I had um, about four weeks off um, in February into March, looking after my son who had some major surgery and I came back to work about the middle of March, straight into smack bang pretty much all systems go planning um, as COVID was starting to heat up and things were changing around us on an almost daily basis. And I would wake up in the morning and Lisa, who I co-manage with all attest to this, with these thoughts in my head that I quickly write down, I'd come in and, and what you see in front of you is that our whiteboard that Lisa and I were just using as a dumping ground of all the things that were in our heads that we thought we need to get um, in line and a handle on and systems up and running um, to face whatever was coming at us, which we were only seeing what we could see overseas at that point in time, some of the horror stories coming out of Europe and America and really not knowing what our experience was going to look like. And when I stood back and I looked at this whiteboard with all, all these bits of practicalities on there, what stood out to me was that how are we going to find a place for support and understanding of what our staff were going through in an environment that they'd never faced before? Um, how are we going to get them quick and easy information sharing in a um, process where things were changing sometimes on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly basis even? And how could we also get them connection? Um, we've worked really hard across the precinct over the last several years to build up some really lovely networks between the social work departments. Um, and we'd already had our World Social Work Day event cancelled because we weren't able to socially distance and um, be all together. And I could see that this was going to sort of be an ever evolving process. But I also, as Lynette mentioned, was thinking, how do we keep track and a record of the clinical changes and the opportunities that we were living through in an environment that none of us within our generation and the generations before us had experienced before? And what was that going to mean to our clinical practice? How is it going to change? And what worked that we would want to keep going forward? Um, as Lynette said, she and Lisa Brady and I were having a meeting about an uh, unrelated research topic. We've worked very closely together for many years on different research practices and Lisa and I were just consumed by COVID at that stage and we couldn't even focus on anything else going on around us. And this kind of conversation just sort of bubbled forward about what can we do? What are our opportunities here? Um, and given that we have a close working relationship with St V's and the Royal Melbourne has a close working relationship across the precinct, it made sense that as a kind of a network of hospitals in the same geographical area, we could come together and, and work on this. So we started building the base camp project across that kind of wave one of COVID. And just as it was coming together, things were looking pretty bright. Um, there was no real sign of, of the second wave coming at us at that point. And for us across the, um, the precinct, Royal Melbourne, Royal Women's, Peter Mac and the children's further up the road who had already lived through it, we were about to embark on a rollout of an electronic medical record, which is also going to change our whole practice as well. And I remember at that point thinking, are we actually going to have a space for this project now we feel like i feel like we're over that first hump what's going you know is it is there going to be a need for it and then all of a sudden wave two came right at us and knocked us off our feet just as we were rolling out base camp and really it was the perfect time to do it because all of a sudden all of that support that i thought 
we're going to need all that information sharing platform was there, bang, smack, ready to go. And it made such a huge difference, I think, to how we were able to get through that second phase of COVID. Um, stress levels were up. The time was right to make this happen. For us at Royal Melbourne, and Lisa's going to give you a much more detailed rundown of what it was like for social work in, the, in that environment, we were hugely impacted by what was happening in aged care and subacute, um, and we were in that first wave of hospitals that took patients from nursing homes into the hospitals to care for them. Um, our ICU and our emergency departments were slammed and our ED continues to be slammed with what they're calling the third wave of mental health presentations. And as Leith and Danielle have indicated, we were able to interview our clinicians in aged care, in ICU, in ED to really capture their experience, which I think was rich for me to hear as well as a manager. You know, I was hearing their stories every day, but to have that perspective. I think what we've learnt, as Lynette has said, is going to take us forward into the future, but I think the connections that we've made are even more important and um, the trivia event that, came, that happened today is almost in some respects I think the most important thing because that was what I thought was going to be missing, that sense of connection, that sense of fun, that sense of relief amongst social work, social work colleagues, to be able to find a platform for that to happen is really important. So I'm going to hand over now back to Lynette, who will run through um, with the rest of my colleagues their experiences. Thanks, Lynette. Thank you very much, Alison. And now we're going to hear from Sarah Connolly, who's the manager at the Royal Children's Hospital. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Lynette. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us in this virtual way. Um, so I guess I'm talking a little bit about our experience dating right back to the start of the pandemic um, and just thinking about social distancing and social work and as you all very well know social work by definition and in every sense is social so how do we um, how have we reconciled the challenges of physical distancing with promoting connection and care um, of course, as social workers, we naturally incorporate physical presence and care and comfort in routine encounters, but more so in challenging circumstances with people who are very distressed or in shock or hearing devastating news uh, for the first time in the hospital context. So here at the Royal Children's Hospital, um, we rapidly developed some principles by which social workers could assess the most appropriate mode of service delivery um, and so this really helped staff to think at a time when you know it was difficult to think sometimes think clearly to think about whether a telephone or video contact was possible or whether face-to-face -face contact really was essential and clearly in the pediatric setting we didn't have the large numbers of COVID positive patients that our adult colleagues did have. Um, in our setting throughout all the phases of the pandemic response we assess that responding to severe trauma, end of life care, bereavement care did require significant face-to-face -face contacts. Um, and again, in the children's setting, reduced, and I think for all of us actually, reduced hospital activity has certainly not equated to reduced social work demand. And in fact, the opposite has very much been true. Uh, I've spent much time managing this upwards, uh, ensuring our executive and CEO really understand how existing social vulnerabilities and or the impact of having a child in hospital have really been exacerbated by the very many psychosocial impacts of COVID-19. Um, a really enduring feature and impact has been the significantly increased workload for social workers because of that increased acuity and complexity. Um, and moral distress is something that was described um, perhaps not in so many words, but that was a real feature, I think, of several social workers in terms of balancing the COVID guidelines, needing to do the right thing and providing optimal psychosocial care. And this is certainly reflected in the emerging social work literature. I guess the very strategies that have traditionally been used to provide comfort could now, in fact, increase the risk. Um, so some authors have talked about an identity crisis for social workers and associated need for reflection, of course, and role definition. Um, and here this evening in early October, 
I would like to think that we've mitigated some of this risk um, around moral distress by restocking our toolkit, if you like, with kind of new strategies for the COVID era. And a few points I just want to make on this slide, which are very specific to the context of a children's hospital. Um, firstly, thinking back again to March, April, um, the early days of the pandemic response, the public, of course, was unfamiliar with PPE, and many of us didn't even know what the acronym PPE really meant. And I guess as social workers, we were really acutely aware of the physical barriers to connection that were posed by remote contact with families and obviously wearing masks. Um, and at times, those encounters really were awkward and constrained and led some of uh, the team and my colleagues to feel like they were unable to provide a level of service that was needed in particular situations. Um, from the children's perspective, we were really mindful of kids' responses to masks, um, potentially confounding an already frightening and unfamiliar situation in hospital in which their parents were already very stressed. Um, attending to, to this was a really important uh, component of social work intervention and probably something as a parent of young children myself I was very aware of in, you know, in the general um, sense. And just want to mention the visitor restrictions, which you, you'll all be well aware of um, in the hospital context. And for us, and I think again for all of the, the um, health services across Melbourne, the visitor restrictions have added many layers to social work responses, both in terms of um, the emotional toll on families, as well as the need for practical assistance that would usually be provided by members of the child's extended or immediate and extended family. Um, and for a long time, until uh, about 10 days ago, one parent at the bedside and no other visitors has been very, very difficult for children and family systems. Um, of course, for many families, they're also juggling the care needs of other kids at home. Um, for social workers, we really um, felt we needed to bridge the gap in, in various service systems, such as the reduced support available in hospitals from volunteers, um, external organisations, and in, including charities and support um, groups, and of course, families' own natural support systems, which uh, things like grandparents providing care, etc., have essentially disappeared, um, as well as major changes in service provision by agencies like child protection, maternal and child health services, and other community service providers have really required flexible and quite creative responses from hospital social workers. Um, I, I would also note that at this stage in the pandemic response with a view, hopefully, to schools um, returning next week, the view here, I would say, from a paediatric hospital feels, um, as I said last week and Lynette had on a slide, it's a bit like being absolutely in the centre of the storm and really at the same time waiting for the next storm to come and bracing ourselves. Um, we are already seeing some very concerning child abuse and neglect um, situations. There's, as um, others have mentioned, there's a, a major increase in mental health issues. Uh, as you would know, and we are seeing some very tragic outcomes actually for children during this hard lockdown. And of course, children have, are less visible than they've ever been in terms of the surveillance and monitoring that would usually be in place through um, home visiting services and, and particularly schools and childcare. So we really are waiting to see, I guess, what is yet to present. Um, and like every other stage of the pandemic, we really will need to and will step up and respond to this challenge and continue to advocate for social work resources to, to meet this um, growing and sustained demand, particularly when hospital activity levels do ramp up um, to usual um, levels of demand. And I would say this will almost certainly not be business as usual for social workers, um, as you'll hear a bit more about from some of my colleagues to follow. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Sarah. And we're now going to go to Fiona Craven from the Royal Women's Hospital. Thanks, Fiona. Thanks, Lynette. Um, so the Women's is Australia's first and largest specialist public hospital that's dedicated to women's health. Um, we cater for the local community and we specialise in pregnancies, complex pregnancies from across Australia. And the way that we were impacted by COVID might not be what you expect, and it certainly wasn't what we expected from the outset. So in social work, we see patients at key points at their own and in babies, their babies' lives. 
And this includes a variety of patients. So patients who experience complexity or vulnerability from a medical and a psychosocial, psychosocial perspective, uh, patients who give birth to babies requiring special or intensive care, and also patients making the choice to terminate a pregnancy. Birthing is a really stressful at the best of times, and you only get one chance of being born and one chance of birthing each baby. So it's really important to do it right. And it's important that we do all that we can to help. What we quickly realized is that COVID made accessing necessary healthcare for especially our vulnerable patients really much more difficult. So as a background, um, as you'll probably already know, on the Wednesday, the 22nd of July, as a result of increasing rates of transmission of coronavirus, the Victorian Chief Health Officer restricted access to hospitals generally. This had understandably significant impacts for maternity hospitals. While individual hospitals were allowed to tailor their own additional requirements and restrictions for visitors, most hospitals, including the women's, did just that. So in normal times, visitors and support people for mums are welcome and encouraged. And on the surface, you think that this type of support would be a fait accompli. But in the time of COVID, this ran headlong into these restrictions. So these restrictions, both general and women specific, ran the very real risk of causing some patients not to want or feel comfortable, or in some extreme cases, to be able to access medical care. And support was often the one thing standing between patients and adequate care for either themselves or their babies. An exemption process was rapidly created in recognition that patients' lives or in social situations are complex and require tailored approaches to care within a social model of health. So by way of example, and I do stress that these, not are, these aren't real cases in their entirety, but an example of some of the situations in which social work advocate. So we advocated for patients who had previous um, perinatal loss and experience of significant pregnancy and then hospital related anxiety. Patients who'd had a previous complicated or traumatic birthing experience and who now suddenly find themselves requiring care at a specialist hospital due to pregnancy complications. Uh, patients who experienced previous sexual assault for whom aspects of labor or giving birth were triggering and re-traumatizing for them as survivors of sexual assault. And for many survivors of violence and sexual assault, the, wa the mask wearing regulations um, really meant that for some, the idea of coming to a hospital setting was terrifying, just, just too hard. COVID meant that for some of the patients, social work engagement and intervention with a view to seeking their story and their, their um, and after that an exemption was really essential. Social work was the best place to wrap up their story and advocate for their needs in a way that allowed our executive decision makers to deviate from the chief health officer's rules and our own rules in order to support the patient and their family. So in a typical week, we submitted between 15 and 20 requests. And I can also say quite proudly that no exemption request from social work was rejected, though I might've just jinxed the department now. Sometimes it's a simple thing. It's a single thing that makes a complex um, case, but more often it's a multitude of things. Um, and COVID has really shone a light on those complex cases where everybody in the hospital and involved in the care was in agreement that in-person support was needed for a particular patient. But there was no other discipline that were able to articulate the why in order to really frame the exemption requests. And often it was only social work who knew the patient's story that could advocate on their behalf. At the moment, while our lives se seem to be dominated by figures and stats, so, you know, waiting for the daily COVID count and the rolling averages, we have to remember that every, behind every dot point is a human story. And what we found at the women's was that focusing on a patient's narrative and needs in a tough exemption process made the world of difference at a pivotal moment in their life when they were given birth. Thanks. Thanks so much, Fiona. And now we're going to go on to St. Vincent's and hear from Lisa Brady, manager, and Melinda Collins. Thanks, Lynette. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that the information we're going to talk about um, might raise issues for people. And so we've got some support information at the end of our presentation if it's required. 
Um, the need for social distancing and lockdown in, uh, to reduce the spread of COVID-19 has had a profound impact on the mental health and wellbeing of people worldwide, as has already been acknowledged. Um, when the restrictions were announced in Australia and escalated in Victoria, we anticipated that many of the victim survivors were going to have be significantly impacted and would be at increased risk of family violence. This is largely because family violence is about the perpetrator wanting power and control over the victim survivor. Perpetrators choose to use coercive behaviour to isolate victims uh, victims and make them fearful. The restrictions have created an environment where the victim survivor and the perpetrator are always together. Restricted movement of five, five kilometres around um, home and stay at home campaigns, while effective in responding to COVID-19, have increased the opportunity for perpetrators to use violence and reduce the victim survivor's ability to reach out for support and enact strategies to keep them stay safe. Um, to guide our social work practice, we reviewed our hospital-wide um, family violence notification data. We focused on February to April 2020, looking at the total number of confirmed notifications of family violence as a percentage of the total hospital presentations. We compared the same time for the previous year and we found that notifications on average had more than doubled. Arguably, that could be attributed to the government awareness campaigns, education and training, additional funding that was being made available at the time, um, and emerging community action. But at a practice level, restriction of movement, home isolation, curfews, presented a range of potential safety and planning challenges in practice when working with victim survivors. We needed to quickly identify the impact of COVID-19 on people living with family violence and presenting to St Vincent's so that we could support them not only during the pandemic, but beyond. Um, we focused on evidence and connected with our health colleagues as, it, as has been described previously. Um, and we commenced an exploratory study combining clinical data mining and staff focus group approaches. Given the nature of the pandemic, um, our study will be ongoing, but we have yielded some really important findings to date, which I'm going to hand over to Melinda to discuss. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, everyone. Um, so since the onset of the pandemic, we have seen an impact on family violence cases at St Vincent's. What we have seen is that 100% of victim survivors have been women, and current or ex-partners and adult children have predominantly been perpetrators of primarily physical and psychological abuse. And 50% of victim survivors have stated that they have an increased concern for their safety since the onset of the pandemic. And so we have looked at risk factors and discovered key themes to explain this. Victim survivors have spoken of the COVID pandemic triggering more anxiety and increased feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, and this has impacted on their coping strategies. Victim survivors spoke of their physical isolation from professionals and the dramatic way this occurred left no time to adjust to the change. And we saw patients with multiple presentations to ED as a means of seeking support. The impact on carers was very evident in situations of elder abuse. Overwhelmingly, services ceased coming into the home and there were no eyes on the situation. And there were expectations from the perpetrator for carers to provide increased care, given they were always home. And we saw an escalation in risk by the perpetrator and the victim survivor always being together in the home. Sometimes there were multiple perpetrators and there was persistent surveillance by perpetrators. Decreased protective factors were evident in almost every case. From a formal perspective, we saw things such as difficulties accessing residential care and cessation of in-home services. And from an informal perspective, for many pandemic-related reasons, there was a limited ability for family members to visit or provide support. 
We also saw that perpetrators attempted to control and limit access to technology and communication devices. However, we also saw an increase in appointment at attendance for some victim survivors and disclosures via telehealth, which resulted in an expanded ability for the clinician to provide support regarding family violence. So we've just begun to identify and provide evidence about the COVID-19 pandemic effects on cases of family violence at St Vincent's. We are seeing decreased supports, increased opportunities to use violence and victim survivors having increased concerns about their safety. And as social workers, we have an important role to play. We must use our knowledge about the impacts of COVID-19 on family violence to identify, assess and address risk within the context of the pandemic and continue to collaborate with victim survivors, families and colleagues to keep victim survivors safe. Increased access to technology has been a silver lining for health professionals. However, as we are beginning to use technology and telehealth consultations more and more, we must also consider how to keep our clients safe with this medium and to incorporate the safe use of technology with victim survivors. And finally, we must use data throughout the pandemic to inform ongoing education needs and service delivery. Thanks, Lynette. Thank you, Melinda. And now we're going to hear from Catherine Ludbrook from the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. Thanks, Annette, and hello, everyone. Um, Peter Mac is Australia's only public hospital solely dedicated to caring for people affected by cancer. We have over 100 inpatient beds and see over 11,000 patient, outpatients per month from around the country. Peter Mac has essentially been maintained as a COVID clean hospital in the precinct due to the fact that our population has a higher risk of contracting COVID-19 and having a poor outcome if they acquire the virus. As we know, feelings of anxiety, depression and fear are commonly part of the cancer experience, but COVID-19 has effectively added another layer for cancer patients. The main fear has shifted from, will I die from cancer to, Will I die from COVID-19 and will I die alone? Some of the triggers um, that exacerbated feelings of anxiety, depression and fear for our cancer patients were that treatment, including surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy, is generally and understandably frightening and debilitating. The reality of going it alone has increased during this time along with the underlying fear of being admitted to hospital, having limited contact with family and friends, and ultimately not making it home again. Non-urgent appointments and treatments were sometimes delayed or interrupted as we tried to reduce the numbers coming into the hospital and work with our precinct partners to ensure we could assist with any influx of COVID positive patients. People became fearful of attending our treatment thinking the trip in, sometimes from regional um, areas, might put them at risk, or just being in the hospital around others might also expose them to COVID-19. So in summary, um, in the eyes of people with cancer, hospital became a potential place of risk rather than the safe haven that it used to be. And we're working really hard to turn this around. I'm now going to highlight the key impacts for our patients and carers from a social work perspective. Alongside heightened levels of anxiety, depression, face, um, depression, face to face contact with healthcare professionals has decreased. The use of telehealth and virtual care has not impinged too much on our ability to provide counselling. In fact, patients and carers have expressed overwhelming appreciation that they've been able to talk with social workers via telehealth, saving them from travel and attendance. We've learned that um, there is a place for virtual health care in outpatient cancer care post-pandemic. Visitor restrictions have been a major issue for inpatients, heightening feelings of uh, loneliness, isolation and boredom. We've been negotiating contact on compassionate grounds on an individual needs basis, for example, between children and dying parent. Um, but even so, this has been limited to immediate family. Of course, we are connecting people using virtual means, but there's nothing like close human physical presence when you're suffering. 
Longing for connection and support is human nature, as we know. One issue my team have highlighted is the angst for patients of having to choose a single visitor during the single visitor for, um, policy when effect, you know, essentially you have a whole family of people out there and friends and, and loved ones that you want to see. Longer hospital stays have resulted uh, due to the difficulty with discharge and lack of access to community supports in general and into aged care specifically. We've also faced many complexities transferring interstate patients home with changing state by state quarantine rules and paperwork. The organisation has been very supportive through this period and further realised the value of social work and our skill of thinking outside the box. Financial stress is always a stress with cancer, but again, COVID-19 has added another layer with so many job losses. We used our Cancer Cancel grant money very quickly and then had to find other ways and means of providing short-term emergency relief. Parenting stress is also worth a mention. Um, it's been of significance with sick parents trying to manage homeschooling or just not being able to rest while the children were normally at school. There's been an increase in carer burden with restricted visitation, access to support services and family and friends. Uh, we must consider the impact of the denial of a good death, surrounded by family, friends, pets, and achieving those small wished, wish list things. And also, I guess my final thing is a denial of a good funeral. Many of our patients have been quite saddened by the thought of no grand celebration of their life and loved ones not being able to comfort each other in person. We've seen the adaptability and value of hospital social workers and the impact on the quality of life for people affected by cancer at a time when quality of life is so acutely important. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Catherine. And now our final speaker for this evening is Lisa Wojciechowski, co-manager at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Lynette. Hello, everyone. Look, as everyone has brilliantly articulated, COVID has complicated absolutely everything we do in providing medical care and psychosocial support to patients and families within a tertiary health setting. And while the dumpster fire that is 2020 continues to burn and various industries and sectors are disrupted in unprecedented ways, I don't see social work disappearing anytime soon. Sure, our practices may shift and evolve to accommodate a new COVID normal, but social work isn't going anywhere. In fact, I'd argue now more than ever, we're in demand. And I say this because as our organisation grappled to respond to the emerging patient and staff needs presented by COVID, the social work department was approached by several areas of our health service to step in. So it was social work that was called upon to extend our service hours in the ICU and ED in recognition that COVID has complicated discharge, the management of risk and the distress of patients and families. It was also social work that was called upon to provide backup to our contact tracing team around self-isolating COVID patients in recognition that for many people, staying at home for two weeks may be simple in theory, but in practice can have significant implications in terms of physical safety in instances of family violence, psychological, financial, and even material well-being. It was social work who took the lead in mapping specific referral pathways for our patients experiencing homelessness. And it's social work whose contact details are now routinely given to families of patients who have died at our health service, regardless of their COVID status, in recognition that COVID has profound implications for the very ways in which we grieve and ritualise the processes of death, dying and mourning. Social work was also called upon to sensitively support families move their deceased loved ones through our anatomical pathology service in anticipation of the limited capacity and likely increase in mortality rates due to COVID. And it was social work whose skill set was most valued when supporting our own staff, our very colleagues who were furloughed as a result of either acquiring COVID through their workplace or by virtue of being a close contact. So in our tertiary health setting, that let's be honest, privileges biomedical knowledges above other perspectives, we are being called upon to respond to the social consequences created by the virus and the measures adopted to contain it. In a setting where normally much of our work isn't visible, now more than ever, the importance of our work is being seen and is being valued. 
And when I think about it, why wouldn't it? I mean, we've got it all. If anyone can respond to a global pandemic, social work can. And that's because we understand complexity. Through a multi-dimensional lens, we understand the multiple impacts of COVID from a personal to a societal level, which gives us an edge and an ability to provide what's needed in more than one domain, which means we can attend both to a patient's emotional distress as well as the material conditions contributing to or causing that distress. We're pragmatic and adaptable, which makes us excellent problem solvers and is one of the reasons we've been so fast at adjusting our practices to incorporate PPE and other modalities of support like telehealth. We are excellent communicators and we bring people together. So in a complex and siloed health system, we've worked across multiple areas to provide cohesive and coordinated responses to staff and patient need. And our skills are transferable. That's why when we're asked to step off the ward and instead provide support in other contexts, we can do that and we do it well. So for me, in a global pandemic where the future holds absolutely no certainty in terms of the economy or job security, I know there will always be a need for social work. And that's why I believe pursuing studies in social work is the best way of future-proofing your career. Thank you very much, Lisa. That was a wonderful final um, discussion for this evening. I'd like to thank everyone who's participated tonight and also the 106 social workers who participated in base camp and everyone who's contributed to this wonderful event of profiling the role that health social work has been playing in this COVID-19 pandemic here in Melbourne. And now we've got time for a little bit of discussion and I'm going to hand over to Ralph to coordinate that. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you, Lynette. Um, yes, wonderful presentations, everyone. Um, and I'm sure there will be more questions, but at the moment I have one question, which is, can the St Vincent's team describe more about the relationship between tech and domestic violence? So um, over to one of our St Vincent colleagues. Um, I'm happy to take that question. Um, I think that's something that we at St V's and, and probably every hospital and social worker is, is learning daily. Um, I think what it comes down to is um, technology is being used as a means of of control and coercion. And I think during uh, COVID-19 when we have been relying very, very heavily on technology that has become so evident um, and, and we're learning every day about about ways that, that perpetrators are doing that. And what we've found helpful is is linking in with specialist family violence services, um, such as Safe Steps in Victoria, um, to, to work in, um, into safety plans about technology and keeping people safe through the use of that. Um, so that, that's what we're learning at St V's. Um, great. We've had some details. It was an excellent presentation. And uh, they'd like to know a bit more about how you as managers supported your staff of uh, social workers through this period. So um, maybe, Alison, if you could start, and then I'll just get a few of you to comment on that. So we've done a... Um uh, a few things. Some some of it's been a bit hit and miss, I guess, but I think what we found very quickly on was communication is key, especially in a space of constant change and everybody's a bit change fatigued. Um, and we've done that in a, in a couple of different mediums, making sure that, you know, we're sending out emails um, when something big is happening so that people are in the loop. We have a, um, a kind of a... a, a, a a workspace Facebook for one of I think that's pace, that's the medium it comes from where we can post videos. So I um, went through a phase where every Friday I try and do a bit of a kind of an update video just so that we can get the information out in a different kind of way. Um, with my team leaders, because they were really copying the brunt of all the changes, I moved from a monthly supervision to a weekly 30-minute catch-up with all of them, either via the phone or um, online, just so that they had a space where they could offload anything they needed to offload, but also we could... Um, uh, you know, work through any issues that were coming up. And we also moved to um, weekly team leader meetings, which was 
partly about support and partly about checking in, but also the practicality of how quickly things were changing um, and how every week we were almost having to realign what our ward and our staffing looked like. So, yeah, we, 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 we've used lots of different mediums. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to ask, we've got a whole flood of questions now, as you can imagine. Um, but uh, Janet Farrow, who's the president of UMSWA, has thanked us for it and, uh, and how you as managers um, have really stepped up to support our community. So I guess our thanks to all of you that mm. you have stood up strongly for social work and also been valued, it seems to me, in ways that maybe you didn't think about before. So well done. Um, the other question is, what kind of challenges were experienced in, mul in collaborating with members of a multidisciplinary team? So, Sarah, could you say something about that? Uh, sure. Thanks, Ralph. I, I think uh, one of the things immediately that comes to mind is, based at the Royal Children's and Wiccan Electronic Medical Record, immediately uh, we had large numbers of staff working from home across the organisation. Something like 70% of our outpatient activity shifted to telehealth. It felt like overnight in, in March, and sim that still sits at around that figure. So I think some of it was... Um, obviously finding new ways um, through equivalent of Zoom meetings, et cetera, to really connect with multidisciplinary teams. Um, it was about maintaining a presence in those teams and for social work to be visible and vocal in the way that we would normally be on the wards. Um, I think some of it was not social working our colleagues, but um, recognising in ourselves and in our colleagues across the board that everybody was stressed and um as it was said earlier in the evening, um, for every, I think Danielle actually articulated really nicely. Everybody is living and working COVID, and uh, we don't we don't necessarily know what um, other stresses people are bringing into the to the picture. So I think it was some acknowledgement of that, and um, try to trying to work with that as well. Um, and the the last thing I would say was um, probably. Uh, thinking about areas that we hadn't um, uh, perhaps been so active in and thinking about where we needed to um, spread the already thin resources to kind of meet demand through through teams. And through all of it, um, recognising that social work was at the forefront of the um, hospital response and still is and will continue to be, and I think that's been really positive. I'm just going to, we're getting lots of congratulations, so that's are great for you guys. And um, there's a question from an old colleague of mine and teacher, Prue Brown, who is very concerned about families who are unable to be with dying patients. So I'll allow anyone to answer that. But I think, Catherine, maybe you've, you go first. Um, yes, yeah, sure. I mean, there's been, a, I guess, um, uh, a dual thing around, you know, lack of access to, um, as I said in my in my um, brief speech, that, you know, when you're suffering, when you're dying, when you and the element of wanting to have a good death and the limitations around that have been extreme, really. Um, and also the other element on the other side of it is our, the staffing. Well, we've had 50% of our staff working from home. Um, uh, well, actually, it got up to 70% um, at Peter Mac as we tried to reduce traffic, but it went out back to about 50%. So, um, you know, trying to do our work virtually um, as well, which I think we've actually succeeded really, really well um, with. But I think social work skills come to the fore in that we've had to negotiate person by person in terms of getting people in at the right time. Um, and as I said, our exec has been fabulous around that, saying we need for this for these children to come in. You know, we need them to come in uh, now. Um, same with um, partners and occasionally, you know, um, uh, other other people. So it's around. I guess you know, it comes right back to the the, the basics of being flexible, listening. Um, and communicating and responding to individuals' needs. They're the, you know, the, the key social work skills have come to the fore, really, and I don't, I, I don't think I've ever seen a time where social workers have been so valued, to be honest. Thank you, Catherine. That probably is a note to end the session on because I want to stay on time. You all have lives outside of this, um, and it's the arsenic out for many parents, I imagine. So what I'd like to do is to 
thank Lynette and all the speakers for your presentation tonight. We're getting lovely feedback on the Q&A function, letting us know how much people have enjoyed the diversity of the presentation and the different issues. I'd also like to say that tonight has been a bit of a partnership between uh, the Alumni Association, AMSWA, Practice Research in our university, students, and you as practitioners in the field. And I think that's what our department is committed to, is to bringing those voices together. So I'd like to thank Janet Farrow, who came up with the idea of putting this together as an alumni event. And I'd like us also to thank the alumni team who are often hidden behind these presentations. So Kirsty and Jessica from our alumni team at the University of Melbourne have provided all the support to make this go so well this evening. So on that note, it is 6.30. Go and have a lovely evening and let's hope we have many more of these, uh, I'd like to see out of the pandemic, that we have many more of these sorts of events where we bring, bring together practice, the academy, the alumni, so that we, and students, so that we can actually build um, the social work profession even further. So thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.